Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another segment of Authors on the Air. We're part of the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. And it's really my pleasure today to sit down and talk with Margot Duwahi, a really talented author that you're going to get to know a little bit and seeing a lot more of Margot in the weeks and months ahead, I can guarantee it. But for those who don't know Margot yet, um, Margot is the author of the crime novel Scorch Grace, the inaugural title of the Gillian Flynn book's new imprint, Zando. Scorch Grace, Scorch Grace was named a Euro New York Times Review Editor's Choice, Best Book of 2023 by Marie Claire. And Margot is originally from Scranton, Pennsylvania, now living in Northampton, Massachusetts. She received her PhD in creative writing from the University of Lancaster and her bachelor's degree in English from the University of Pittsburgh. She's the author of a poetry, poetry collections, Bandit Queen, The Runaway Story of Bell Star, Scranton Lace, and Girls You Like, Girls Like You from the Clemson University Press. Margo's also a, a, an assistant professor at Emerson College in popular fiction writing and literature. So Margo, welcome. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here. I love being part of the mystery and crime fiction community. So it really is a privilege and an honor. Well, no, I think, and that's one of the things I wanted to talk about you. I mean, you're you're an established poet. How how did you come to our dark door and <laughs> become a crime fiction author? From knocking on the door and the windows, <laughs> rattling the windows in the night. Um, well, thanks. <laughs> I just truly love being part of this world. And yes, I wrote in the shadows and in the in total obscurity, essentially for about fifteen years. Um, poetry is my first love, but the, the twin obsession was always mystery as well. More from the, the reading and the consumption and the viewing part of the equation. I think the PBS Sunday Night Mystery was the only thing that united my whole family. So, um, you know, and I've, I've shared this as well, but I might have been the only kid in Scranton to dress as Poirot for Halloween, but lifelong obsession. Poetry was my doorway into creative expression through what I feel like are, is an ability to freeze a moment or just look at something mm -hmm. from a completely other perspective. I, I think poetry has a lot of investigative sensibilities in it. And, and of course, there's a long lineage of folks who write poetry and mysteries like Edgar Allan Poe and Margaret Atwood. I discovered all of that a lot later, but yes, I just, I think my poems just started getting longer and longer and longer, centering riddles and puzzles more, uh, you know, kind of concretely. And it was just something I felt like I had to see if I could try to do was merge those two worlds, those two loves, those two lenses of mine, poetry and mysteries. And so took a wild swing <laughs> at it and yeah, I would say, I think it, the first book took me more than four years to put together just oh, conceptually, okay. plotting it, thinking through theme. And so it's been a long, meandering, lost in the woods kind of road. And I've met a lot of incredible people <laughs> along the way, including yourself. Oh, thank you. No, I, I, I really can sense your background as a poet in, in your in your prose because it really comes across. It's deep. There's a lot of layers to it. And I mean, the series started with, you know, Scorch Grace. Everybody can take a look at that. Um, fantastic series. And what I really, really am drawn to is the character of Sister Holiday. I mean, she's she's so unique and so present in the moment in, in the stories, but she's not Jessica Fletcher bouncing around Cabot Cove, is she? <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not. Um, if if Jessica Fletcher had a switchblade in her pocket and a gold tooth from a bar fight, maybe. But having said that, the high camp of uh, some of the world of cozies, as well as the high camp that's so integral to LGBTQ communities and queer expression is something that I do try to honor and bring into the mysteries. But I have always loved the hard boiled school, the wisecracking lone wolf kind of fisty cuffs, but really inside there's a lot of terror and a lot of turmoil and also a deep yearning for connection despite 
their pain. And so that interested me as well. How do I occupy a lone wolf through this young, tatted up, hot tempered, faithful nun who doesn't make a lot of sense to anyone around her, but does make sense to herself. And so I wanted to thread the needle with my take on a hard boiled inspired character because I just adore that sensibility. So that was really some of the impetus behind creating this somewhat unusual sleuth that people would want to follow for a limited series. Yeah, I mean, you really you really draw people in because I think it's so unique. I mean, you've got a, a tatted up, chain smoking, gold tooth, queer nun in a con small convent in New Orleans. I mean, that if that doesn't suck you in right away, I, I don't know what does because I mean, that's just that's just off the chain. It it it's so it's so good. Um, where did that initial inspiration for her character come from for you? You know, I went to Catholic school, <laughs> and I did sit there a lot. And in, well, maybe I sort of stared out the window a little bit, <laughs> and I, I might have been a little bit of the character of Prince Dempsey in the books. Um, a little lost, well, a lot lost, but the nuns that were my teachers were not your kind of typical um, tropes. They weren't mean, they didn't hit us, but they were very removed. They were both of the world and outside of the world. And for the, I always conflated that, the type of the sleuth figure who's usually unmarried, they're usually an orphan, um, you know, that's again, more hard boiled to me, uh, or even, you know, Poirot and Miss Marple, you know, something about a sleuth who's not quite of this world, but in the world. So when I was thinking to sit down and write a sleuth character that felt authentic, that felt layered to me and unusual and unpredictable, like a mystery herself, that I kept coming back to my youth and thinking about those, the nuns who were my teachers and and bringing a new fresh perspective on that. And then also queerness and queer futures where you could occupy a life. Like for example, if you wanted to join the hierarchy and participate in these liturgical experiences and you didn't want to renounce your sexuality, but also my character, you know, again, threading the needle is, is celibate, but she's out. So it's definitely fiction. But I'm I'm trying to write into sp spaces that feel emotionally authentic, and so at first blush, people might think, well, that's not really a nun then if she's out and queer, but in her mind, she very much is, and so that's part of really the unfolding of the mysteries are these aspects of her personal experience and her journey and her arc, and her imbricated identities. They're really part of the riddle. Yeah, and, and I I like the way you kind of gave her that depth and layering where she could be, you know, out, but also devout. And she doesn't see a conflict there at all. And I thought that was really, really well done. It gave it was really something to kind of sit back and think, okay, yeah, I can I can see that. Yeah. Now before I before I forget, I mean, Scorch Grace was recently um announced as an ITW thriller fest thriller award nominee for best debut novel. That's just awesome. And also uh, for the Left Coast at Left Coast Crime, Lefty Lefty Award nomination for best uh, best debut. That's awesome. I know. I'm I truly have no words. <laughs> I really don't. Again, just <laughs> this sort of oddball writing in obscurity for so 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 long and just doing something that I really loved and hoping that it might come together. It's just beyond my wildest dreams. So thanks. Yeah, no, people are, people are connecting with the story, the character. And I mean, when you were writing this and when it was first released, did you, could you forecast that it was going to be this kind of positive support and reception uh, for the book when it came out? No, I mean, I love, I'm such a fan fangirl first and foremost. And so to be able to be in the community of crime writers, of mystery writers who are just, you know, the coolest and the best and so supportive is such an honor. Yeah. And 
I think because, I mean, I probably should have known that there would be so much solidarity, but yeah, it just, I feel still like it's a bit surreal. So, and, and definitely I think the uniqueness or let's just say the specificity of character is something that I felt. Yeah. And then there is definitely some pushback you know, for a while there were some almost like readers warning other readers that the book was actually quite queer because they heard about it on, you know, the Today Show when Gillian Flynn was on yeah. and some of her readers that might not have been prepared, I guess, for the for the kind of right. deep commitment of, of queerness. But ultimately, though, that's just like one, you know, one small element. It's been I've been so overwhelmed and surprised by and delighted. By the support. That's great. So, with I think within a like a week, you've got the the sequel coming out, and that's um, let's see if I can get a good picture of this here. Blessed Water, and that's the the sequel to um, Scorch Grace that we saw. Can you tell us a little bit about the story in Blessed Water and what Sister Holiday is facing in this new story? Absolutely. I want each book in the series to have their its own rhythm, its own emotional color palette, its own world. And so Scorched Grace is really concerned with burning and incineration. And let's say there's meta narratives that relate to that as well. And similarly with Blessed Water, I wanted to throw her into the deep end with other aspects of her emotional experience. And so her brother figures in very largely into both the mystery and the narrative. But the story is set over three days. I wanted to write something that felt like a poem in that it has economy and it's it's sort of cut to the bone in a way that hard boiled that I love is cut to the bone, particularly um, Chandler and although he's also a poet, but I like to call a poetic realist. But um, Chester Himes and, and other writers that I love, they work with the economy in a really beautiful way, but there's a richness. So we don't sacrifice richness and layering. So the story of Blessed Water set over three days. It starts with Sister Holiday pulling the dead body of a priest out of the Mississippi River and takes off from there. And I wanted to write something that really felt like a rush of water, tears, drowning, submerging, swallowing and so that is that propulsion and the kind of intensity is there in each of these lyrical uh, acts as it were for you know good friday saturday and then culminates in easter sunday yeah no it's it's dynamite and folks if you haven't picked up this one uh and this is one you can read even if you haven't picked up scorch grace um it'll be well worth your time uh it's, it's a great another great a great story um so you, and you just mentioned that when Gillian Flynn was on today's show talking about, about Scorch Grace, how did that feel when you learned that Scorch Grace was going to be the first pick on her new imprint? This floor, I was on this floor. I fell out of this chair and, and onto this floor. And that is that is absolutely the truth. I I was writing... I had the great fortune of landing with an agent because of a contest that I entered that I did not win, but the agent was my agent, Laura McDougall is brilliant. She's with United agents. She was, she was like, you are weird. <laughs> and your writing is very unique. Uh, if you revise your draft, I'll sign you. I worked with her. She signed me COVID hit, you know, long story, but she put the book out on after also her maternity leave just at the same time that the amazing, iconic Gillian Flynn wanted to shake up the publishing world and start her own independent imprint to give space and, and amplification to writers doing different kinds of things within the mystery space and thriller space. In my agent, just, she, she was trying to catch me. I was writing, the, actually I was writing <laughs> Blessed Water when the you know a number of years ago actually at this point three years ago yeah because it was a full year before then scorched grace came out and i had everything off wi-fi off phone off and so she was trying for like an hour to say, get on zoom i have good news <laughs> it was just you know i didn't really understand how imprints worked they were they're still quite relatively new 
where you have someone who knows, you know, readers know and trust mm -hmm. and trust their tastes and also their contribution to the cultural discourse. And so I'm just ever so grateful. I call her, you know, she's like my book angel because she really is. And I'm very grateful to to her as a person as well. I re I recently reread Dark Places and because mm. she's bringing yeah. it to HBO. Um, she's going to be the showrunner and adapting it. It'll be out, you know, I'm not sure the timeline of that, but yeah, I'm just, I could be more grateful. I could wax poetic about about her and just my gratitude for writers helping other writers. And I hope to do obviously the same one day. Yeah. No, I, th I think it, however it worked out cosmically to get you in that place and connect you with, with Gillian. Um, I mean, it just made the book more visible and people realized, okay, there, there's something here. There's something new, a unique voice. Um, and yeah, there's not much like it. So yeah, I think it was a perfect place, right place, right time. You know, what can I say? Yeah, likewise. And that's why I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Still am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, in your other half of your, your world, you're you're a, uh, a professor at Emerson. Yes. Yeah. So what one thing would you tell your students, um, knowing what you know now and your experience, what what one thing would you would you tell them about this this business? That good writing will always be seen. It may not work on the timeline you think. And that if you believe in something, you have to double down on it and be open to feedback. So this is more than one thing, but it's connected. Yeah, it, <laughs> it really is. is about patience and about perseverance and the need for resilience whilst staying true, 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 true to the thing that brought you to the space because thank God we're all different because how boring would it be if we all wrote the same stories and we right. all said the same things? It's like, who cares? You know, we want to, we want a diversity of opinions and formats and styles and paces and all of it. So everybody has a unique entry point into it. And so what I tell my students, it's what I tell myself, which is double down on your thing plant your flag in the in the weird zone that you're in or the slow burn zone or the traditional zone or the hybrid genre zone or the categorically police procedural zone your thing you do it as much as you can with your uniqueness and have patience have the patience and be open to feedback that's that's per that's great advice yeah that and a lot of folks come into the business and they're in such a hurry and it this it just does not work that way so that's great advice for folks how about flipping it around what have what have you learned from your students oh every single day this morning i was just blown away by a student's uh, work on their you know i teach a course called plotting the perfect crime and so just the relationship to craft elements like structure temporality but I think what I learned from my students is that, you know, our art is so real and deeply connected to our sense of identity. And so the way they've found themselves through art and specifically mysteries and crime fiction, it's so beautiful and it's so affirming. So, uh, yeah, I just see the ways that it, you know, like light through the prism. It just sends so many people in so many different directions, but ultimately it's, it's their, you know, journey of self-discovery. So I'm very, very passionate about what we do in this space and it gives each other life. It gives each other energy. And yeah, they, they, sh they're really, they show me that and they teach me that every day. Wow. That's great. That's great. Now you've got, I mean, just a monster of a schedule ahead of you. Um, I think you're going to be just about in every, especially on the East coast, every city that there is. Uh, but you are breaking out and coming out to Tucson for the Tucson Festival of Books. And I, I really hope I get to find you there. Me too. But yeah, it's you're 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 crazy. I mean, this 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 is a busy, busy schedule. Wow. I can't say no if if someone in I love 
I love nothing more than just hanging out with both writer, other crime writers and readers. The readers are the best. And so yeah. the festivals are so kind to invite me. And I know all, it's just, they, I never forget them. It's like you can spend a day at a festival or a weekend of, at a festival and you remember it for 50 years. They're so fun and they celebrate what we do. And also, you know, COVID was just such a juggernaut. It was, it shut down yeah. the world. I love being back in community. You know, I write alone in isolation and then the opportunity to kind of come to the world with one another and celebrate. It's medicinal, yeah. an elixir. I it love is. for it, I live for it. And I love to get to meet authors like you who I adore and who have been reading oh. for years and vote for, okay. for the Edgar Awards and <laughs> getting to meet one another, hearing about each other's processes our highs, our lows. It's very life-giving to hear that we struggle with can, you know, sometimes the same things or have questions. It's really yeah. something it's hard to say no to. And yeah, so like in a bookstore, yeah, no. when they reach out, I'm just like, oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. No, I, it, and folks, if you're, if you're listening and if you have a chance and you're near, near a city, um, Check check this one out. You're gonna you're gonna want to come and meet meet Margot. Uh, we'll finish up with what I call three quick hits, and that's three questions, just you know, quick off the cuff relating to in this case, Sister Holiday. Yes. What's Sister Holiday's favorite cocktail? Ooh. Um... <laughs> it's gonna be the with her favorite cocktail right right in this narrative present where she's in is going to be the nip of whiskey that she confiscates from her student ryan brown but it has the it's it's cut with the blessing of holy water <laughs> i love it i love it how about what um what's her favorite music oh bikini kill hands down yep. and then yep, of course with the interlude of liturgical chanting. It's a nice, nice mix. Um, and then finally, what's Sister Holiday's greatest fear? Oh, Sister Holiday has so many fears. <laughs> She's just cascading in fears. Um, I think her greatest fear is that that nothing, nothing has meaning. She's she's looking for meaning. And so loss of meaning is worse than loss of life for her. That That's sense. those are the stakes. Those are her stakes. Yeah, makes sense. Folks, this has been a blast to sit and talk with uh chat with Margot about what's going on in her in her world and her, her new books. And it please get out and uh, and see her if she's on tour near you. And don't forget to pick up that book because it's it'll blow you away. It's a really awesome. So, Margo, thanks, thanks for spending some time with us, and I hope you had fun. It was a blast. Thank you so much. I could do this all day. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> James. All right. You take care, and uh, come back and join us again soon, folks. Without a doubt.